Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting. Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show that seeks to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ. And on today's show, we'll be talking about the invocation of saints. Do Lutherans invoke the saints? What role do the saints play in the life of the Lutheran Church or as Christian believers? We certainly know that uh, uh, for our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters out there in Christ, that it plays a prominent role for them. But we're going to we're going to dig into this uh, topic today that uh, still there's a lot of questions in our parishes. Uh, I know I get them in my parishes. I'm sure uh, the other members of the panel here get them as well about this issue uh, still going on and even many years after the Reformation today. So to talk about this as we look at the uh, Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 21. We have our usual cohort of Christ-confessing Concordians here today, layman Peter Slayton, Pastor Merritt Dembski, Pastor Peter Ill, and myself as your host, Pastor Sean Smith. To remind you, we are a call-in show. If you have questions about the saints and what role that they play or uh, things as we continue on this topic today, you can call in at 1-800-730-2727. You can also find us on social media uh, at KFUO Radio, right? Yep, got it. And uh, also KFUO at KFUO.org uh, for email. We'd be glad to take your questions and address them as we dig into this topic. Brothers, as uh, we jump into this topic, any opening thoughts uh that you have be, before we dig in here. One of the things about the invocation of the saints is this is one of the big things that is still noticeable as a difference between uh, Lutherans and Roman Catholic Christians, where we begin to go back and forth and people will say, well, as Lutherans, we don't pray to the saints or through the saints. Uh, um, and sometimes there's conversation about that distinction. Uh, the short answer, as you were asking in the introduction, Pastor Smith, is do Lutherans pray to or through the saints? And the answer is, no, not really. Uh, we don't. Uh, but we do recognize that there are saints, made saints by Christ, through the sanctifying and holifying work of the Holy Spirit. And those saints do, while they're alive, pray for the church. Uh, we recognize angels, too. But we don't count on the prayers of those saints uh, after their death for us. Instead, we look to them as people to whom Christ has given faith and examples of God's mercy and people that we get to imitate and we get to live in the church as they are in the church. And so we don't pray to or through the saints, but we do indeed uh, look at saints. Well, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of times people suggest that uh Luther was very schismatic. He was trying to create these branches and division. And if, if you wouldn't have had that happen, you'd just have all this unity and everything would be perfect. And why can't you just go back to Roman, Cath Roman Catholicism and have this unity that people have? And yet, uh, not every, uh, Roman Catholic will even have the same kind of personal theology of the saints, you know, and every time I talk to someone, uh, that I know has a Roman Catholic background, part of my question is, so where do you fall on the, the saint stuff? Especially if they're asking questions of what's the differences, they'll be like, do you pray to the saints? Do you not? And they're like, ah, my aunt did, or my grandma did, but I don't really, you know? And so this, uh, the, there is a lot of confusion even amongst, uh, Roman Catholic individuals of what the role of the saints is and how they play, uh, a part and whether they do and whether they really take that seriously and engage in that or whether it's just something that you can if you want to, you know, but it's still part of the teaching and it's not something that has disappeared or was back in the day, but not anymore. It's, it's still very much there. <laughs> yeah. Just on that point right there, I want to respond to that. I, I have found in my own uh, experience and so forth that uh, American Roman Catholics have been very influenced by reformed bodies, bodies that came, uh, church bodies that came out of the Reformation, uh, and, uh, have become very American in their understanding of some very key doctrines that are still there in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, uh, one of them being the saints. And so that's a good question to ask is, you know, what, 
how do you view the saints and so forth? And I find most Americans don't really fall down uh, quite where the Roman Catholic Church still does in its official doctrine. Well, and we've already moved beyond a, a kind of a big assumption here at, to start off with in that there are saints. What are saints? I mean, my, my own personal background coming from American evangelicalism, well, saints at all of any kind, well, that's a, that's a Catholic thing. So having a church that is St. John's Lutheran Church, whether it's St. John the Apostle or whatever, but just having a saint in front of the name makes it a Catholic thing. And so here we are going through the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, and we're finally getting to this idea of saints, but we've already jumped beyond the, well, yeah, there are saints. And we're, and we've moved into, okay, well, what about invoking them? So I think, um, I know we'll end up talking a little bit here well, about what are saints well, and how do we actually talk about this as Lutherans? Cause, hey, there are some really good, helpful ways to talk about this. See, see this is why I have Layman Slayton on the show. Um, <laughs> because no, this, this is, this is actually quite excellent. Um, one, because of your background and also, um, you know, you just bring that, that forefront of thought. And, and that's really where I want to start, uh, with this, cool. um, is set up a Glad couple things. Glad to help out. Yeah. Well, one is what, what what do we mean by saints? And then the other thing is, is what do we mean by invoking? What what does that word mean? Um, but let's deal with saints first. And I'm going to throw it back to you here, Layman Slayton. Um, you, so you talked about you know coming from kind of what we call the broad American evangelical background, yeah, um, and so forth. Uh, that the saints thing is entirely Roman Catholic. So talk a little more about that. Talk talk about your experience there, and and maybe talk about what has helped you understand at least the way the Lutheran Church talks about yeah. saints and, and how we are identifying it here for the purposes of this show. So in, in my own background, I, I as I'm as I'm remembering, I think the only time we would have talked about saints at all may have been when we're, you know, reading passages in Revelation that talk about the saints underneath the altar and that sort of thing. And or there's a the really nice person that brought the cookies. Oh, they're a saint. There is. <laughs> See, uh, yeah, that, that could have happened too, especially if you're coming from the South. Yeah. You get a little bit more of that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I never attended a church that was named Saint anything. Like that just never would have been done. It's named after the town that it's in, usually, is the background. So even that that's not there. There's no reference to saints as part of worship. Um, whatever liturgy is used, whether it's more of a contemporary liturgy or, or other things, there's no reference made to saints of any kind. Uh, so the vocabulary itself, as, you know, as Pastor Dembski pointed out, isn't non-existent, but for the sake of the, for purposes of the church and congregational setting and worship setting and even theological conversations, the word simply really never really came up. And if it did, well, it was a Catholic thing. And it's because Catholics pray to saints, and it's like St. Patrick, the patron saint of whatever... Shamrocks. He, shamrocks, okay, eggs, or luck. Yes. There we go, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that was the context, and it was simply, I mean, just the... the and then let me put it this way, it was a total ignorance on what saints were, combined with any knowledge I did have was totally stereotypes. <laughs> well, and, and when I first started digging into uh, understanding what saint meant and all that stuff, it became a beautiful thing because uh, and any time I'm, whether it's in confirmation or if it comes up in an adult Bible study or something, it's always about a 30 to 40 second explanation of saying saint, meaning, you know, set apart, holy, all of us through the waters of baptism. We're all saints. It's not a levelish thing, you know, a leveling hierarchy thing. It's nope. We're all saints. We're all set apart. We're all through Christ. That's where you get the sanctus, the holy, 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 you know, that word. And, and then you get to Halloween and all hallows and holy and all saints day Eve, all hallows, you know, and you, you get to that whole thing. It's usually 30 seconds to a minute of saying, here's what I mean by that. Not some hierarchy, not some you know, like thing. Yeah. It's just dear saints. <laughs> that's all of us in, in baptism, in Christ set apart in him. And, <laughs> and that is what helped me with with the transition and being comfortable with it is oh this this is not creating that hierarchy mm -hmm. this is not creating a higher level of christian and it's not something that's exclusively reserved for somebody who's dead and going to be sainted in in the the roman catholic sense um where they have their whole process for that but it is simply set apart holy and you can use it for all christians living and dead 
And I would even go so far as to say, as Lutherans, we talk a lot about saints, but we don't talk about the recognition of saints. Uh, the The official word is the canonization of saints. That's the word, um, yep. Where they are incorporated into a body uh, of recognized saints. And that is something that we don't do. We simply talk about all of those who are made holy by the blood of Christ as being Christ's saints. Um, and so, very much like you said earlier, we don't go... Uh, hog wild on this idea that they're any kind of a better Christian. They're somebody that Jesus has made holy. The way to become a saint is by Jesus. And that's it. Uh, there's no uh, miracles necessary, uh, no uh, exemplary life, no well known uh, things that you need to do. You simply need to be loved by Jesus uh, and be a Christian and uh, b- repent and believe in the gospel. Yeah, I want to hold on to this idea about the canonization of saints and kind of the role that they play after death and and, and kind of that special status that you were kind of talking about Mm -hmm. there, because I think we're going to return to that idea. Um, And and especially as we're wrestling with this in the apology, Lutherans are going to kind of concede a little bit that when they're talking about saints, they're, they're almost talking about it almost exclusively for a little bit there in terms of those who are passed on. Um, not entirely, but it, it, it's definitely a big part. So it'll be coming back to that, and I do want to come back to that. Um, but Merritt wants to interrupt me before I go on with my thought. Yeah, I, I, to ask if we will talk at some point about how grace and the nature of grace plays into all of this. Because you get to the, the, the idea of grace being this thing you earn, and you have like the bank account, and this guy has more, and he can give it to you, versus it being, are we going to get to that a little bit? Later? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. That I mean, all. if you nothing else, you can certainly jump in. I mean, you are gotcha. a member of the show. Um, <laughs> but you, well, I, you do know, do I thought have we had show power. prep for this kind of yeah. thing. I didn't know. I didn't. I wanted to make that's sure. That's not in the outline. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, actually, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely be coming back to it. It's a good thought to, to play in here as well. Oh, you even put in the outline, Merritt, make sure you read this part. We will definitely talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. School. Um, but um, if, if, if you're following your outline, which our, our listeners don't have, but the folks in our studio do. Um, I do want to also talk about what I said in in our setup here of what do we mean by invoking? And so uh, you guys talked about, you know, how you, uh, uh, the the general understanding where there's the lack of teaching of what the word saint means and what it's tied to and things like that. And I think you guys did an excellent job of laying that out. Um, What kind of fills the void is what general practice is. And we've just been influenced heavily by Roman Catholicism. um, And, and it's, it's, it's kind of influenced where there's that void that that's that understanding is that we pray to them, right? So you, you guys were talking about. So so let's talk a little more about what invoke means. What what do we mean by that? Merritt, I'll go ahead and throw it to you. Okay, uh, to call out on or to, uh, uh, to, to, yeah, call out to, to ask. So when I'm talking to confirmands and we're talking about making the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we're talking about prayer, we're remembering our baptism, we're remembering God's promises. Um, I've I've more recently, just because of how you always see it in popular culture of like something dangerous about to happen and someone makes a sign of a cross, I'm like, it's not some sort of force field. Like, okay, I made the sign. Wall. You know, I'm like, now there's a holy force field around. Activate me. Jesus field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you don't have that type of thing. Instead, it's calling out to God, remembering uh, what he has done for us. And when we start every Every church service, uh, well, almost every order of service, ha- a divine service has it, but uh, some of the like morning prayer and stuff doesn't necessarily. But when we have... Because um, those are our, prayer offices where right. we're invoking the whole time. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Um, the... Uh, um, Sorry, I lost my Just train derailed of thought. Just derailed The yeah. snark derailed the whole train of thought. <laughs> Boom. But um, no, definitely yeah. on, on this yeah. liturgy note here and so forth, and, and this is, I'm just, because I'm on the radio and I'm the host, I'm going to get to, like, get on my little soapbox here for a minute. But it really kind of irks me when uh, you see pastors, uh, especially in the Lutheran Church, doing the invocation, right? Same word at the beginning and they're facing the people and it's like they're putting a blessing on them right and they're making the sign of the cross and everything no the theology of worship invocation we are invoking we are calling out in prayer to god in his triune name and what do we do as pastors whenever we're praying we face the altar right and so this is this is the proper order okay i'm off my soapbox <laughs> I, i'm not saying that your pastor's a heretic if he faces you when he does the invocation i'm just saying i just can't believe you actually have a folding soapbox that you carry in your bag 
bag. I know, and right? Just put away. What? Yeah, that and is I, why he has I was such able a to move bag. the microphone as I went up on yep. it and everything, yep. and now I'm back down. <laughs> All right, uh, but no, th- this is, this is a part of of the theology of our worship, right? Is that we begin with this invocation, which the divine service. I know I derailed you with the whole yeah. prayer offices thing, which is a whole invocation, but but our divine service is too, right? right? And that's why we begin with the invocation right. there. And. Yeah. Luther even gave the directions that each day was properly begun with the invocation and the sign of the cross. Uh, when you wake in the morning, make the sign of the Holy Cross, give, say, the invocation and the Our Father, and pray the Ten Commandments and the Creed and uh, the Lord's Prayer and the morning prayer, and then go about your day. Uh, as he, as you invoked God's name on what was to come, and at the end of the day, you once again called upon God's name, invoking it. Uh, I do think there's a, a distinction that as we have these conversations with, especially our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ, they will sometimes bring up this distinction. Well, you say that we pray to the saints, but it's, it's more that we pray through them, like we're asking a friend to pray for us. Uh, and that's, that is a clear part of their established body of doctrine as Roman Catholics. Uh, the part, though, where the Lutheran Confessions in this article of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession uh, is going to make a distinction is, it's one thing to ask a living saint, your friend, your neighbor, your family member, to pray for you. It's another thing to ask someone who is deceased passed to pray for on. you. Passed on. I, uh, and... That's a that's a different thing. We don't ask our deceased friends and brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for us. And there is no confidence given in Scripture that that is something that happens, that that the deceased hear what's going on here on earth or that they pray for us. Yeah, that that's another soapbox. Stephanie, I'm going to need you to get me a soapbox like... Um sound effect for every time I get on a soapbox. But this is another place where... And give us control yeah. over it, so we're just going to start pushing that button. Yeah. So, so this is another w- place where I think maybe as Lutherans, sometimes we don't help ourselves uh, when we talk about, you know, when someone passes on, right? You know, oh, I know Grandma, she's up there looking down on you and smiling, and it's like, okay, now you're kind of transgressing that line again where Scripture, and I think you hit the nail on the head, that's the place I always go in a very gentle and loving way with our Roman Catholic uh, Roman Catholic uh, brothers and sisters is uh, cite one place in scripture where we have any confidence that after death you have any knowledge of what's going on on earth right uh, as you're as you're gathered around the throne room it seems like what we have in scripture is that you're rather occupied with the praise and worship and your center focus is Christ uh, the entire time there um, and, and and awaiting the the return of Christ. And, and it's not simply, it's not only a matter of being occupied, but it's also remembering that it in, in, in the next life, I don't know, that's probably not even the right way to say it, but in, in death and eternity, when you are living this, this sinless, perfected life, you are in bliss, looking back to earth and seeing the sin and death and brokenness that is there is not consistent with, with the bliss and sinless life that we are promised after this one. And so, yes, here's here's your goal. Here's what you're doing. You are now worshiping perfectly in the presence of God. But part of that perfection is there is no sin. There's no tears. There is no sorrow. Therefore, how can we ask or expect our, you know, relatives who have passed on to look back on our sorrow? It, it, it doesn't make sense on that level either. And the one place in Scripture where there may be somebody uh, from the dead interacting with the living uh, is at the first king is at the end of First Kings, and it's not good news. Uh, and that's a whole different conversation and a whole different Bible study. Hopefully, for a different show that's not Concord Matters, that would be fine with me. But I do love to talk about King Saul and the Witch of Endor, but we'll have to do it another time. <laughs> So you're just going to drop that. There's a teaser there. for a show there, that doesn't exist. There's a teaser exist. for a show that doesn't exist. <laughs> or as you're listening at home, uh, after this episode is over, go grab your Bible, turn to the end of First Kings, and look for Saul and the Witch of Endor. Actually, that show does exist, and it does exist on the excellent radio station of KFUO. I know for a fact that that came up on Thy Strong Word maybe a couple years ago. So okay. you can it's go back there. in the archives and listen to them. Well, the, to the other discussion. example that we could bring up would be um, when Jesus is telling the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But the problem with that one is 
Lazarus himself, with, there's nothing in that account that mentions Lazarus seeing the rich man. All it's all it says for sure is that the rich man can see Lazarus in paradise, but it says nothing about whether Lazarus can see the rich man. And and, and if somebody's going to bring that up, the as fact an example, that both are passed on. Right. And that it says there's a great gulf, a chasm yeah. fixed between. I mean, if somebody's right. going to go to yeah. that as, well, here's another example. Yeah. And, that and neither of them see the living. Right. Yeah, Lazarus. As a matter of fact, the, the rich, rich man, man says, send them back to, uh, send them back to those who are still living. Right. Yeah. yeah uh, my brothers. And, uh, and, and that doesn't happen. But yeah. all right. So let's get back to, to this actual article as it comes to us in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. I also want to set up one other thing in our setup kind of section here is before we dig into actually reading it here and discussing, uh, those words. Um, what, what specifically is in mind, uh, of what the Roman Catholic Church is teaching at the time and what we're responding to here. And and here I, I want to make the, the point um, that it, it seems rather, and we'll see this as we actually read the text, but it seems rather pointed that they're addressing two main things. One, prayer to the saints or through the saints, uh, however you kind of want to look at that there, um, uh, or word that there rather, kind of works out to be the same thing, I would say. Um, but then also that this idea, and this this is tied in with the good works issue, the big issue at the time of the Reformation, is that the good works of the saints are meritorious. They give you some benefit, right? And so uh, talk, talk about those two things. Uh, I'll throw it to merit, since I said the word meritorious, merits on the brain. Perfect. Perfect. Got it. Um, so when we talk about the nature of grace, that was one of the big issues of the time. Is grace like a currency that you go to the Lord's Supper and receive some grace? Do you go and do these journeys and pilgrimages and get some grace? And therefore, the people who do a lot of those get a lot of grace. And therefore, they, they become sainted. They've done these things. And when you can go to them, they can do a transfer to some of you to to you for some of that grace and so uh with uh, how scripture talks about grace being god's disposition toward us his mercy his love for us we don't have that uh, notion or picture of currency in scripture and yet that root ends up being so much of you know anytime people suggest that Oh, every teaching is just a little thing. It doesn't really matter. It's like, no, it, that body of doctrine point is huge because all of a sudden you see the little ripple effect that affects so many other teachings. Um, for example, the invocation of the saints. There's this guy up here. He, uh, he's died, but he's a saint. He's got, he's got a better in with God, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Or like the image I always like to use, they're like spokes on a wheel, right? You know, the hub is Christ, but how many of those spokes do you want to lose and have any confidence in that wheel? Right. All right. Especially yeah. if you're using, you know, like a bicycle wheel or something. Uh -huh. And that that's a great point as we are talking through this, whether it's with our Roman Catholic friends or American evangelical friends, is this is a, what Pastor Dembski just said, is a, is a point of commonality with us and our evangelical friends and that we both agree that we... You know, we pray to Christ and through Christ. That is that is how prayer works. That's that's what we're supposed to do. Where we may then differ is on what a saint is and how we talk about that. So as we're walk, talking with our evangelical friends, the conversation we can affirm, hey, yeah, we actually believe that we pray to the to the same thing. Here's where we have a little different view of what saints are. The conversation is a little more difficult with Roman Catholic friends because there's there's that additional we get you can pray to Jesus and there's all this other stuff too and it's it's a little bit more difficult to have that conversation well and as when we get as we get into the text of this soon it's amazing to see the the implications that are pulled from it that it lowers Christ and his importance it lowers the nature of God's grace you know all of these things that are the natural end results and implications of this teaching that become a problem Absolutely. Well, uh, this has all been great setup, and I promise we will get into the text, uh, but uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break. I invoke you to come on back. You're a miracle. You know that, right? 
a living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. I'm World Lutheran News Digest host Kip Allen. A military chaplain and his assistant have been cleared of charges of dereliction of duty, a court-martial offense. First Liberty Institute represented Army Chaplain Scott Squires and Staff Sergeant Casey Griffin in the case. First Liberty's Mike Berry is my guest today on World Lutheran News Digest. World Lutheran News Digest may be heard every Wednesday at 2.30 and Saturday at 9.30 on Worldwide KFUO. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Hawkinson, host of Moments of Assurance, inviting you to join us for our fall KFUO bus tour. We're going to be traveling to the historic Missouri State Penitentiary, the oldest one west of the Mississippi. We'll have a guided tour through the hallways where famous prisoners once walked like Pretty Boy Floyd, boxer Sonny Liston, and James Earl Ray. The penitentiary was built in the 1830s with beautiful stone masonry architecture to match. We'll also get a tour of the Missouri State Capitol and we'll enjoy an all-you-can-eat brunch at the famous Eris Pizza Palace. The date, Saturday, September 29. Cost is just 65 per person and includes round-trip luxury motor coach transportation aboard Mid-American Coaches. We'll leave out of St. Louis at 8.30 with another stop in Washington, Missouri at 9.45. To sign up, call me, 314. 314- 9961520314996 The Bible says in Psalm 89 for who in the heaven can be compared unto The iconic phrase heard in most sermons Billy Graham preached was the Bible says so it's fitting that his story is told in the Billy Graham exhibition at Museum of the Bible under the banner Pilgrim preacher Billy Graham, the Bible and the challenges of the modern world, on display through January 2019. In his 70 plus years of ministry, Billy Graham preached from the Bible to more live audiences than anyone in history, 70 million people in 50 countries. And for 60 years, his voice was heard daily on the Hour of Decision radio program. The Hour of Decision. Billy Graham once said, Most books are born, live a few short years, then go the way of all the earth. They are forgotten, but not the Bible. Brought to you by Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And welcome back to Concord Matters with our cohort of Christ Confessing Concordians, Layman Peter Slayton, Pastor Mayor Dembski, Pastor Peter Ill, and myself, which I'm told I'm not allowed to like say I'm a host anymore because my <laughs> brothers here don't think I'm much of a host. If you're the host, you have to remind people yeah, that you're the host. I just, I mean, it's I'm like, just doing what people have always done on the show, all right? But I'm Sean Smith anyway. And uh, sometimes a guest on here too, uh, Reverend Timothy Apple actually just sent me a, uh, uh, a message here where he he is showing me you know in 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 the hymnals it, we we say the black and do the red right and uh, the red are the rubrics and so forth and so from he the is, Latin word rhubar which means red isn't that a vegetable right. so no, that's rhubarb oh so oh. so uh, I don't need it, that either it says here in the rubrics that the pastor may face the altar and sign himself or he may face the congregation and mark them with the sign of the cross however that's kind of my soapbox is I think Still? we changed because of what was common practice, not because of the theology of the church. So I just had to share that. Pastor Apple is an excellent pastor. Um, and whichever way he signs the cross at the invocation is okay because he's just a good pastor. But Still, uh, I'll just write a, a paper about it, and then we'll fight this out in the academic world. Um, but uh, <laughs> On the internet. Yeah, but not here on Concord Matters, because here we are of one mind. That's the mind of Christ, and we, we, we love each other, and we get along, and we have Concord with one another. But with that, uh, there, there was a good question tied with Concord. You like that segue? I, I do, I do. I like Concord. it a lot. And, and, and it has to do with what is close or closed, and, and the communion that we have, and things of that nature. Uh, so, so go ahead and take a, take that away. We've Pastor. received a wonderful listener question from, from one of our listeners who wrote 
been that in the Apostles' Creed we confess that we believe in the communion of saints, but it seems that we close some Christians out of the invitation to the Lord's Supper in our congregations. And because this is conquered matters and we strive to be of one mind, uh, I would like to turn to the large catechism in answer to this. And it's... uh, it's in the Book of Concord. It's in the I'll Book of Concord. It. Okay. No. Glad I'm not voted off the island yet. <laughs> uh, That's next week. <laughs> in the explanation of the third article of the Apostles' Creed, Martin Luther writes, The Creed also calls the Holy Christian Church a communion of saints. Both expressions taken together are identical. But in the past, the expression communion of saints was not there. This phrase has been poorly and unwisely translated into the German as a communion of saints. If it is to be rendered plainly, it must be expressed quite differently in a German way. In the same way, the word ecclesia, that's the Latin, properly means in German a gathering. But we are used to seeing it translated as the word church, by which the simple do not understand a gathered multitude, but the consecrated house or building. This is true even though the house ought not to be called a church, just because the multitude gathers there. For we who gather there make and choose for ourselves a particular place and give a name to the house according to the gathering. And so when we hear the word communion, it's not talking about the the Eucharistic fellowship or the gathering of the the people, the church, around the Lord's Supper, but is rather talking about the communion or the concord that the whole church has together. Uh, there's an awful lot more to say about communion fellowship, but as we talk about the communion of the saints and the gathering of the saints together, that's not... Uh, a reference to the Lord's Supper as much as it is to the commonality of the Christian faith that we share. Well, and so part of that question uh, has to do with where are we finding our communion? Where are we finding our um, our unity? Is it just in is it just in our uh, our uh, friendliness with one another and that we are doing nice things and, and acting loving, or is it what we believe and what we confess as Christians? And so part of that also gets into what are we confessing? What are we believing as Christians? And are we actually finding our unity? Um, and in in our day, it seems like we often jump to, we'll agree to disagree or we just won't talk about it. Therefore, we're now in communion. It's like, no, we, we talk about what Scripture teaches. And just like we said before the break about the little ripple effect that we see of teaching, one little teaching here ends up making bigger ripple effects down through. Well, and this is another good example of why it's important to carefully define and explain the words that we're using and to, and to rightly understand them. Because once again, from my background, communion really meant the Lord's Supper, which we did, you know, once a month or every quarter or whatever it was back in, you know, when I was growing up. Um, And so coming from that background and reading the Apostles' Creed Creed or saying the Apostles' Creed, when I say the word communion of the saints, I'm going to think the Lord's Supper, which I think is to a certain degree what what the listener has done, the same thing. What we have to keep in mind is, well, we're not necessarily using the same word for communion. And actually, as Lutherans now, I... I think the only reason I use communion is because that's more a holdover from what I've come from. Um, more and more often, I with my kids, I'm, I think they use the Lord's Supper. I think that's the most common one. Maybe maybe Eucharist a little bit here and there, but really talk about more as the Lord's Supper. And that at least helps mentally distinguish those two ideas from each other a little bit. Yeah, I, I have found in my pastoral ministry at least you know a good sixty uh, percent of my teaching work is just defining what words mean and what we mean by by what we're talking. About. And it's been really helpful for me to have uh, married an English major, you know, to to kind of work on that task too. But uh, uh, that was a slow development for me, even growing up in the Lutheran Church, of just realizing you know, we we need to understand what these words mean and what what it is that we're saying when we use them. Uh, because as I said in the in the first half of the show, otherwise what you get is this void, and the void will get filled by usually incorrect assumptions and so forth. And so it's really helpful. Or, to or when the words have changed meaning over time and recognizing, okay, it doesn't, it no longer means what it used to mean. I might need to adjust what I'm saying here to make sure that I'm communicating what I'm intending to communicate. Well, and it's actually a real pity because so oftentimes when we start trying to define our terms, people think of that being 
the boring, lame, unnecessary part. We just got to go out and love people. It's like, yeah, we love people. And why do we love people? Is it because of what we believe or because we think that we're going to earn merit with our Lord for doing Should, should we just ask nice? them to define people? Um, what do you mean by people? Oh, see. And just see. get right yeah. back in. Yeah, problems. We don't need to yeah. worry about defining things. Just get and love people. Well, what do you mean by people? And what do you mean by love? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like all these things, like it's important to have this background. So when I when I talk to confirmation students for the first week or when we have the little orientation thing with parents, I will oftentimes um, bring up the fact that when you are going to play music, you need to know what notes are and you need to know what an instrument is and how to um, make and produce different sounds on that instrument. You just don't sit down and start playing. You know, like you have to have a little bit of this uh, um, discussion of defining terms and digging into what we're talking about as Christians. All right. Um, lest we go an entire show without actually getting to the words in the Book of Concord. I read I'm, some. I'm, I read some. I'm know, ahead of you, Pastor Smith. I, well, I know, but you were in the large catechism. We're in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession but right now. I like now. the large catechism. It was like two years ago I also we were like in the, the Apology large of the catechism. Augsburg con- confession. Right. You did already point out, though, that it was in the Book of Concord. I did, so. and I allowed it. Um, yeah. But but we, Fair, we actually judge need to get arbiter on. That you are. Yes, we, we actually... <laughs> see, that's why I'm the host. To, to bring back that old point. But um, anyway, no, I do want to get into... Our poor listeners. This, yes, I'm so sorry. This, this is just just rough. Um, so just hard break here. We're going to go right Boom, back start to, reading. Just to, go. Uh, to this, which I think will define some of what we're uh, uh, talking about uh, for us as well. So uh, beginning with paragraph one of Article 21, uh, which could also be Article 9, apparently, the invocation of saints in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. They absolutely condemn Article 21 because we do not require the invocation of saints. On no other topic do they speak more smoothly or wordily. Yet they are not able to prove, maybe, I'm just going to, sorry, interruption there. Um, yeah, that's where we get it from. We speak smoothly and we're, but that would make us like the Roman Catholics, right? Or Melanchthon does it too, because this is quite a long article. Yeah, yeah, anyway, back, this is where we that's, learn this to is, be This is anything wordily. but smooth. <laughs> right. Back to, back to this, though. Yet they are not able to prove anything. Maybe we can't either. Other than that the saints should be honored or that living saints pray for others, as though invoking dead saints were necessary for that reason. They cite Cyprian because he asked Cornelius while he was still alive to pray for his brothers after his death. By this example, they prove the invocation of the dead. They quote also Jerome against Vigilantius. On this field, they say, 1,100 years ago, Jerome overcame Vigilantius. So the adversaries triumph as though the war had already ended. Nor do those asses see that in Jerome against Vigilantius, there is not a syllable about invocation. He speaks about honors for the saints, not about invocation. All right, we're going to go ahead and pause there. And I know I was being a little flippant there as I read it and interrupted and everything. Uh, but, I, I mean, you also get the sense here that Melanchthon is just really frustrated with them. We, we've talked about, you know, kind of how he has this, what we would say in our contemporary language, snark, as he writes this. Um, but, you know, you get some of it there. You know, he's kind of making fun of them. Oh, they speak smoothly and wordily on this. And they can entirely condemn this and so forth. But why? What, what's going on here? He's basically making the charge that they're talking in circles. Well, he's... Which is why I did it when I was... Oh, uh, yeah. it was an object See, lesson. Uh, I get it now. It was a joke. Okay, oh, I it. like jokes. Okay, that was good. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> no, I think I, I like it's it may be a little bit obtuse as he's presenting it here just because of his snark, but he's he's essentially saying, look, they're actually proving our point. They're not proving their point. The examples that they're bringing up supposedly proving that the dead saints pray for the living only actually prove that the living saints pray for each other and that's that's it there's there's nothing else going on here um and so as he's bringing up these examples it's also interesting are any of these examples biblical ones I, that would be a no okay that's because uh, i'm like i don't recognize any of these as like biblical names or referencing any biblical teaching so cyprian was an early church father and and i did actually want to get into this one a little bit because he says that Cyprian asked Cornelius after Cornelius's death to pray for him. Here's the thing. Sometimes pastors, even church fathers, 
ask and say things that are wrong. And just because Cyprian asked Cornelius to pray for him after Cornelius died doesn't mean that eternal life works that way. Uh, There's no biblical promise attached to that story and tradition, and there's no certainty or hope of salvation or of intercession from the dead that comes from that story. It It's a nice story, but there's no merit to it. There's we, no, no strength to it. Which is also part of why it's helpful to remember that we don't just follow some guy that said something. We always base it back to Scripture, and we always return back to Scripture. So when someone would say, well, how can you listen to Cyprian about everything else? Or, you know, he made a, he said something wrong here. It's like... Yeah, there. <laughs> like, doesn't mean that everything that he ever said was completely wacky, you know, or something like that. Just, Here he said yeah. something that isn't uh, reinfor- that isn't said by scripture. Right. Other places, Cyprian says wonderful things that are scriptural and true. I find, I was like, sorry, I, say, I find it interesting that as we get further and further into the apology here, we're finding fewer and fewer twisting of scripture, and now it's just well, now they're twisting the church fathers. Like we've we've run out of scripture to twist now now we're just going to take the church fathers and so with, with this article in particular there is almost no scriptural references at all because the adversaries are simply okay now as we seem to be really going far out on a limb with what we're doing to the point where we're not even referencing scripture anymore. Well, but I think that this is an issue that we brought up on the show before that one of the formal principles for how Roman Catholicism does theology is they don't necessarily begin with scripture. Oh, yeah. I mean, we as American, you know, Christians tend to take it for granted because Luther and his whole move in the Reformation was so foundational for what has formed and shaped American Christianity with all the, the reform bodies that make up the bulk of Christians in America and so forth that, that we just kind of take for granted that of course people are starting with scripture, except they don't. And, and it has shown up many times, uh, especially as we've been going through the apology here that, and again, I think that this is kind of the backhand, you know, what we might call snark or whatever you want to call a Melanchthon just kind of lay it to him like he's he's making the ridiculous point at the beginning well see but you're you're subscribing to these guys who said these things and and none of it is based in scripture none of it is based in truth and and he'll get into some of the scriptural claims that they have coming up as well but uh yeah I I do think that this is a real problem is that they're citing this and and this still plagues us you know even as Lutherans sometimes because Luther said something right uh, maybe he was off base or just responding to a particular situation and kind of went a little too far in one direction you know to kind of compensate for how far off on the other direction they were um you know people will quote luther and say oh and you follow this guy and it's like no we don't follow this guy we follow christ the true teachings of god in in holy scripture and martin luther by and large had a lot of really faithful things to say about that right and, and his teaching of what god's word teaches us right um and and as far as that is in line yeah we agree but just because he's luther doesn't mean that we subscribe to it and that's the mistake roman catholics make all over the place and they're making here in their their response their confutation is what they responded uh with uh um to uh the augsburg confession and so they are citing these church fathers that said these things and it's like and and that means what to us (laughs) and i think that even during my lifetime We've started to see a little more of that, not from our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ, but from some of our other brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, from the evangelical faith community or from some more progressive parts of Christianity, uh, especially uh, as there's a lot of talk about humanitarian aid and faithful Christians who do wonderful mercy work, they begin to be referred to as saints. Uh, you have kind of that thought of anybody who, ba- who makes cookies for the potluck is, is saint. But we end up exalting somebody for their works more than we look to them and exalt the faith that Christ has given them. And people have this tendency to want to focus on people and things and actions and not to focus on the faith that is given them by Christ. Absolutely. And and I also wanted to cite here, too, from the confutation, a, a, a few lines 
um, that that you can get the context of what they were responding with here. And so this says, uh, in the this is coming from the confutation. This article of the confession must be utterly rejected and in harmony with the entire universal church be condemned. For in favor of the invocation of saints, we have not only the authority of the church universal, but also the agreement of the Holy Fathers, Augustine, Bernard, Jerome, Cyprian, Chrysostom, Basil, and this class of other church teachers. Neither is the authority of Holy Scripture absent from this Catholic assertion. And so you can just see in their move there, they condemn it as ungodly, unfaithful teaching, the, our Roman Catholic, um, you know, uh, opposition here in terms of the Augsburg Confession. Um, and, and why do they condemn it? Not because of Scripture, but because, well, this is just what the church holds and believes. And and that's where I thought you were going to go for a second, uh, Pastor Ellen, and I think you're definitely on target with, you know, uh, we, we have a confusion of good works and so forth on this as well still. But also I thought you were going to go that, you know, we, we tend to see this you know, and I'll confess, even in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, you know, sometimes we have this mistake where we just say, well, this is what the church does. Well, it may be good that the church does this, and, and I'm not going to dismiss it outhandedly, but does the church do this because of Scripture and because it's faithful teaching? Or does the church do this just because some guys decided that's what we do? Uh, then that's a case of church tradition, which for the Roman Catholics, again, is kind of their formal operating principle there, that they go there first rather than Scripture. And I, I just think Melanchthon's pointing out that's the faulty reasoning of going there. Well, and that's that's a helpful reminder, kind of going back with my question earlier, but what Pastor Dembski was saying at the beginning of the show is that really maybe it was Pastor Ill, somebody was talking about really the what we should be looking for is, does it point to Christ? Does it confess Christ clearly and the, and the work that he has done? So I appreciate, Pastor Smith, what you had said is that, you know, with my question, it's it's not just that it's Scripture first. You know, I think it's, it, is, it can be a downfall if we reject every single argument out of hand that doesn't start with a Bible verse. Okay, that's that's not exactly <laughs> we we can get into that pattern of doing that, but that's not necessarily the best way to do it. Really, what we want to be doing is okay. If we're going to start with a church father, do we end up at Christ? If we're going to start with a Bible verse, do we want to make sure we're actually ending up properly confessing who Christ has done? Because I think that's the point. Even if you start with Scripture, you can still move away from what Christ, who Christ is, and what He's actually done. And so we always want to be bringing all of our conversations back to that main point. And it's the same thing here in their invocation of the saints. They're going in a different direction than who is Christ and what has he done. And and with that, I want to read uh, paragraph three here as well, because I think this wraps up this section quite nicely in, in our point on this. Before Gregory, none of the other ancient writers mentioned invocation. Certainly this kind of invocation and the opinions that the adversaries now teach about the application of merits are not confirmed by the ancient writers. And so he, he's making the point, you know, look, this this in the ancient writers um, certainly passed down from Judaism and, and also the epistles uh, to the churches, the way scripture speaks. Um, you know, all of a sudden, this is just something that shows up, right? Well, why did it show up? And, and it's clearly not scriptural. It, it's, it's an aberration. It, it's not faithful. It's not right. And and their reason is because it's well, it's the application of merits. I mean, we've talked about that before. That's that's the actual problem at issue here. Yeah, it supports this other doctrine that they have that yep. isn't supported in the scripture too. <laughs> yep. But thinking about the importance of applying scriptural doctrine, we've gotten a follow up question from one of our listeners uh, to the question that we had before about the communion of the saints or the fellowship of the saints, and uh, in a in a spirit of trying to understand. And working with us on this, they've written back that the Apostles' teaching seems to teach that we are saints who should be united through Christ by faith. And the listener cites Acts 2.42 about uh, the church devoting themselves to the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of the bread and the prayers, and also to 1 Corinthians 1, where the church of uh, where Paul writes, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, or made holy, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 
And this is where we do indeed talk about the fellowship of the holy people. Um, and so as we're talking about the invocation of the saints here, this is a, it's really important kind of to, to, maintain what our sandbox is and exactly what we're talking about. We are not ruling anybody out of being a saint, uh, not in our conversation about the invocation of the saints and not even in our conversations about who comes to the Lord's table. Uh, when someone is asked not to commune at the Lord's table at a particular circumstance, that's not saying you're not a Christian. It's simply saying we, as a fellowship of saints, have some work to do as we participate together in Christ's death until he comes again. And so we're not denying anybody's faith. We're not denying that they are a saint made holy by the blood of Christ. We instead are working directly with them to say, as people who take this union in Christ, this fellow sainthood that we have seriously, let's work together and continue to grow in that concord, in that fellowship of saintliness, as we all live by Christ's grace. And and we don't just look at one teaching or another. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'll have people say something to the effect of, well, I wouldn't go into a Roman Catholic church and receive communion because I don't believe what they believe, but you should let me come to your table and take the Lord's Supper. I'll be like, do you believe this is Christ's body and blood? Do you believe, you know, and ask a couple of questions. I'll be like, no, I don't believe those things. It's like, then why am I being mean for not having you come up? If that's exactly why you wouldn't go to someone else's altar because you don't agree with what they believe. Um, and, and I had that exact problem not too long ago. Like we, we, uh, you know, I, uh, we talked about the Catholic nature of things in the sense of like that feels Catholic or that kind of thing. But we don't often have people say that feels too Baptist or something like that, you know, like that people don't think the other direction of like, yeah, this is also a problem in the other direction. It'll just be like, well, we're not doing this thing over here and therefore it's fine. So we should all be unified over here, just not them. It's like, no, see this, there's a huge problem. If one of us says baptism is the washing of Christ and bringing us into his death and resurrection and the other person says it's an outward sign of an inward change. You know, if one person says, eh, it's just a symbol uh, for Lord's Supper, and the other says, no, this is Christ's body and blood to forgive your sins. You've got giant differences there. It's not just, well, we can both take it, and we can just seem like we're, you know, so uh, to Pastor Earl's point, we're not talking about whether you're a Christian or not. It's do we actually have this unity in what we confess, and how do we work to get to that unity? And we recognize that we are Christians. Right. We're just working towards greater fellowship and greater confessing together the scriptural truth. And, and so I don't want to give anybody the impression that, uh, if someone doesn't come to the Lord's Supper, they're not a Christian. That's not my intent at all. And I don't think that's any of our intent. Rather, we say, hey, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's keep working towards unity. Let's keep working towards that fellowship and that concord that Christ brings us into. And, and I think that's a helpful example that you make there too about, you know, well, we disagree kind of. You know, for the, for the for the sake of argument, on the other side, right? Although there's not really sides, there's just what's faithful and right. true and what's not. Uh, but on the other side, you know, how you get into the communion with Christ, you know, through baptism, it, it would seem like a bigger disagreement there. Well, at least you know, with the Roman Catholic Church, we have agreement about baptism there, and so so this this definitely brings into that issue of again, you know, wh what we're looking for here is what is true, what is faithful, what does God's word declare to us. Because then the other issue that kind of comes up with this as well is, well, it's really about me and Christ. It's the communion that I have with him as a saint in Christ, um, you know, made holy by his works and so forth. And so it, it doesn't matter what the communion around me says or, you know, confesses. I go up there knowing what it really is. You want to talk about that for just a minute? No. <laughs> no, I guess okay. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, so I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Well, so the some people will argue, right, yeah, you know, it's just between me and Christ. So I come up to the communion rail, and I can participate in whatever church I'm in, regardless of what they teach it is, because it's just about me and Christ. That's the only communion that matters, they say. Oh, I'll talk about that for 45 seconds. Okay. Um, St. Paul 40. writes in First Corinthians that we participate, we all, collectively as Christians, co-participate in the body and blood of Christ until he comes again. And... 
we don't simply and only participate with Jesus himself, but we also co-participate with all others who are gathered with us at the altar. And so we don't want to do this lightly. We don't want to say, well, yeah, we're all close enough, even though we believe contrary things. And so when we gather together in fellowship, this is where with whom we gather at the altar becomes an expression of our fellowship, but it isn't the sum total of our fellowship. And so we have a fellowship of Christian saints that is more than communion. Uh, communion is one expression of it, but it's not the end all be all. Indeed. I like what you said there. It's where we participate with Christ and where he gathers us together. And you, you brought in earlier when we say in the Lord's Creed, uh, the communion of saints. That we're, Creed. Uh, sorry. It's Jesus' That's Creed, too. That's it's okay. Jesus' Creed, too. Sure. <laughs> My word's not working now. Thanks for derailing there. But yes, in the creed, when we confess the communion of saints, that is indeed what we are gathered together for to receive. And so it is good that we have right and faithful confession of this. And so we continue to talk about this next week. Uh, for today, thanks for stopping by. And until next time, keep confessing, church.